Hello and welcome to Law 2022 Online, Commercial Property Spring, Shape the Debate, hosted by me, Mike Georgiou from Move Reports UK. In this live session, you can put your questions to our experts, Richard Snape and Mark Shelton, and interact as the information is being delivered. Today's live Q&A is due to last one hour and will cover your pre-submitted and live questions. To the right-hand side, there is a chat function. All questions are submitted in private, so please ask away. <clears throat> if you're watching a replay, the live chat function is disabled, but you may contact the solicitors group for further information. A recording of today's live session will be available on the website within a few days. So introductions. Um, as I said, my name's Mike Georgiou from Move Reports UK. I have been in the search business for 22 years since July 2000, originally owning and operating the PSG franchise for North London and for the past eight years as the regional director for the South to Move Reports UK. I have helped develop procedures and software replicated and used by many today and have been involved at government meetings in the development of the HIP offering. Today, without the constraints of a corporate company and being truly independent, I help develop bespoke and unique tools and offerings for conveyances. We help, we help our clients secure the work against the competition by following two mantras that are the ethos of our company. Others say they are different, we know we are. And if you don't get the work, we don't get your searches. So that's enough about me. Uh, Richard. Richard has been in the head of excuse me, professional support at David Jones Bold since 2002. He was formerly a senior lecturer in law and head of land law at the University of West of London, West of England, Bristol. He speaks on at numerous courses for law societies all over the country, various public courses in-house seminars within solicitors firms and has also talked extensively to local authorities and central government bodies. His area of specialism include both commercial and residential property, particular in relation to local government law, conveyancing issues, development land, commercial property and encumbrances in relation to land. As part of Law 22 2022 online, Richard's sessions include the LTA 1954 grounds of opposition, renewal terms and interim rents, and development land, how to prevent loss of value, the legal issues. Mark, Mark Shelton. Mark has worked in major commercial law firms for 29 years. As a property litigator, he was at he has acted for a range of clients from FTSE 100 investment companies and major corporate occupiers through to small businesses and individuals. He is an expert in commercial property management law and as well as advising on the structuring and documentation of transactions, Mark has conducted a wide range of commercial property disputes, acting both for landlords and for tenants. Mark is now a non-practicing solicitor and works as a commercial property management law trainer, putting his expertise and experience to good use in training both lawyers and supervisors. As part of Law 2022 Online Commercial Property, Mark's session includes landlords' works, quiet enjoyment and derogation from grants, and rent enforcement, the return of normality. So, to commence the session, we'll be we'll be start by addressing some of the pre-submitted questions we have been receiving from you. So, the first one, um, hi all. I will be I will start by asking. Sorry, the first question: If a lease is outside LNT 1954, what restraints are there on a landlord? When lease requests, when lessee requests lease renewal, right? Shall I go for that one? Um, the answer is it's just purely contractual. The landlord doesn't have any sort of restraints whatsoever. Uh, 
Um, I suppose the one thing to, to be concerned about, if you do decide to give another lease and you want a 54 Act excluded, you make sure you serve the warning notices just as you would, you know, for the brand new lease, but there's no obligations upon the landlord whatsoever. Any, do you want to add to that, Mark? Or? No, I don't think, I think there's nothing to add to that. I mean, only, uh, only the constraint, only the commercial constraints of the market, I guess, is the, um, the well, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. Yeah. I did touch upon it. I think I suspect you might be touching upon it on your your uh, talks. But uh, the one thing that kills landlords at the moment, you know, is business rates and empty properties. Mm -hmm. So I suspect at the moment it would be, you know, pretty advisable to to actually think about getting if the tenant wants to renew the yeah. lease. But I say the important things are to make sure the new lease is 54 Act excluded by serving the warning notices and also if you've got guarantors, getting the written agreement of guarantors because it's a brand new lease. Sure. As to who, what is to who, um, you know, what the terms <coughs> are, like, no constraints whatsoever. Yes. It's pure market. Yep. Okay. On to the second one, quite a lengthy one this, so let's go through it. Uh, when agreeing renewal leases, I am getting told repeatedly the direction of travel in the legislation and generally is to a greener environment and therefore it is, it is reasonable to expect green clauses, environmental performance clauses in renewal leases. How far do I have to go in accepting this, acting for a tenant? Some some of these covenants are fairly onerous. Is it fair to expect I can limit the liability by saying, provided that this does not materially adversely affect the operation of the tenant's business or incur additional or abnormal costs to the tenant? Hope you got that. Uh -huh. Shall I do this one? I fair think... enough. You, you lead on this one. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh... Yeah. Well, if it, let's, I'm assuming it's a 54 Act in your um, The uh, starting point for leasehold terms, I mean, the way the 54 Act deals with lease renewals is they sort of divide between the property, which is a holding held by the tenant at the time of any court order, if there is one. The duration, which is well, no more than 15 years, but tenants don't want to, that kind of duration anyway. The, the rent, which is a market rent. And section 35 of the, the act says that so everything else is just any other terms. And so that would be any other terms. And this starting point is a, probably the most important 54 Act case of all. Uh, it's a 1982 House of Lords case called O'May and City of London Real Property Company. And section 35 itself says so that you have, I can't think the exact wording, but you should have regards to the terms of the current tenancy, the starting point of the old leases and basis of the new lease. And if you want to show otherwise, uh, the burden is upon you, and that includes things like upgrading to, to modern standards and the likes. Uh, it's not impossible, but uh, the burden is upon you know, whoever wishes to, ch to change the terms to show you know, that uh, there's a good reason and it's fair and just between the parties. I say there's more to it than just what the legislation says on occasion. Um, I know the, one of the cases I mentioned, but I didn't really mention it in this context, was uh, the WH Smith's uh, Commons Real Investment Gazelle Shaft. I've been practicing that a long time. Uh, they, uh, it was primarily about sort of rent suspension provisions on the renewal. But one of the things that the, uh, the landlord was trying to argue for is passing the liability of energy audits and the likes uh, on the, onto the tenant. Uh, it's only a county court case it's not a precedent um and also any work that needed to be done but uh the landlord failed on that argument um even if there was a change then i mean the other thing you can look at is it's not conclusive again the house of lords made this clear in may but uh you can uh think about changing the rent accordingly if you want to accept that you shouldn't be paying as much rent yeah, yeah. I, I think. I mean, all. all um, I, I'd add to that. I mean, the the um, the W. H. Smith case, as you say, is only a county court case. Remember that that's the the uh, case with about ninety percent of the authority we get on the nineteen fifty four. Right, isn't it? It's all it's all county court cases, and yeah. none of it's binding. So we just have to keep an eye on what county court judges are doing. But um, um, but yeah, I mean, the OMA principle. I mean, you 
you know, a, a change in market practice isn't enough. You you want to kind of change in the factual background or a change in the um, relevant legislative background. And I, I suspect um, that as in the WH Smith case, a change in a kind of compliance or regulatory burden in um, a sort of non-landlord and tenant aspect may affect the property, but it, it, it is probably not going to be enough to justify a departure from the terms no. of the old lease. No. Um, so. I, it's one of those things like over many years I've mentioned in courses that you know, the starting point is the old lease is the basis of the new leases without regard to the terms of the current tenancy. And um, people just look nonplussed about it. You know, we didn't we didn't know this, you know. And as we speak, somebody is just foisting their new lease upon a tenant who's just blissfully unaware except her. And they didn't have to on a renewal. I mean, some of the other cases that are in the notes, one of my favorites was the um uh, I forgot the name of it, a Howard de Walden uh, case involving Sam Smith's breweries. It's not a well-known case where they wanted to, to change the uh, user covenants. That's the, It's a pub in London and Marliman, which I've actually had a site inspection of this very pub for, for purely uh, work reasons. Uh, and uh, they didn't have the ability to sell cooked food. They go through a lease renewal. The landlord foists their new lease, giving you this ability, which they didn't really want. Uh, and they could object to it. They were objecting on the grounds that on a rent review, amongst other things, they would increase the rental. So yeah. you can't, you know, you shouldn't get something for nothing in life and it should be reflected in the rental as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, just um, to sort of... Uh match your anecdote with my anecdote um i had a had a lease renewal some years ago um the client was a um major multiple retailer the landlord was um a large institutional insurance company and they had their new standard form of lease and they said this is what you're going to take and our form of lease was quite an old one it's about 35 years old and our client's retail director said no i'm not and everyone dug their heels in um and we got to within about a week of trial um with everybody you know not giving an inch and within about a week of trial the landlord caved in because they knew what was going to happen on renewal yeah. we get we, we, we get the lease we started out with so yeah it, it, it's, it's very wishy-washy kind of form of words having regard to the terms of the old lease but it's really got teeth hasn't it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and people forget about o may which is a house of lords case and it is probably the most mm. important of all 54 act cases mm. Mm. so quote that <laughs> okay okay uh, next questions for you, Mark. Um, it seems to follow from your presentation that a landlord can buy its way out of trouble by giving the tenant financial compensation for disturbance due to the work. Isn't a tenant getting compensated twice if it agreed the rent on the basis that the lease contained rights for the landlord to do the work in the first place? Okay, so th this is um, to do with the, the presentation about landlords works and breach of quiet enjoyment covenant and, and, and so forth. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, the, the point in the, in the presentation was um, where a landlord needs to show that it's been, well, it has a right to build, but it needs to show it's been exercising that right to build reasonably. Uh, and uh, one of the factors which is highly likely to dispose a court in favour of thinking a landlord has behaved reasonably is, is that some form of compensation or discount on the rent or whatever has been offered to the um, has been offered to the tenant. Um, but I think, you know, this is picking up what uh, Richard and I were both just saying in the last two questions, really, you know, the rent should reflect the other terms. And if, if, if a lease is agreed with terms that allow the landlord to enter to carry out um, you know, potentially disruptive works, then that is something which ought to be reflected in the rent. Um, so I, I sympathise with the kind of uh, point of the question that yes, to a certain extent, you can argue the the, the tenants getting compensated twice. Um, I mean, I think the reality is that um, tenants are in something of a ransom position here, even if the landlord has reserved rights, because the tenant can always turn around and say, well, you may have this right to carry out this work, but you still can't breach my quiet enjoyment covenant. You still can't cause a nuisance. You still can't derogate from grant. Um, and therefore, you know, we're going to have a fight about it. And, um, and it's always going to be worth the landlord offering a bit more to the tenant to to um, get out of that sort of situation. But um, I, mean, I think um, uh, one, one of the um, uh, sort of defensive mechanisms is, is if one 
has in the lease um, not just the right to enter and carry out works, but an actual com contractual compensation clause saying you know, if the landlord is going to carry out work, then there will be so much of a discount on the rent or, 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 or whatever the, the, the whatever form the compensation might take. Very hard then, I think, for a tenant to come and say, well, you ought to offer me, if you're going to behave reasonably, you ought to offer me some more on top if they've agreed that in the lease. So I think that would help. Um, but I think quite risky for a landlord to sit back and say, oh, but this is all reflected in the amount of the rent. So you can't possibly rely upon that as saying that I'm not acting reasonably, um, unless I think you've got in the negotiations for the rent, if you've got some some clear correspondence that indicates that that was something which was taken into account at the time. Um, but um, but yeah, I, I think the um, uh, the pointer from the case law is reasonably clear that it's going to help a landlord a lot if it's um, offered some sort of compensation to the tenant. No, all those cases a few years back, weren't they? One of them sent a point uh, that you even if you've got those sort of um, terms in the lease, you have to act reasonably, try to accommodate the tenants and, you know, not put the scaffolding up where it's inconvenient for, for sort of visitors and the likes. Yeah. So there are those questions as well, but everything should go down to what the rental is in these things. Mm -hmm. I agree entirely. Mm -hmm. Refer it to a valuer. That's my answer to everything. <laughs> Okay, next question uh, for you, Richard. Can a landlord use ground G and then sell the property later? Yeah, I mean, ground G is, I think it's the most insidious, the most dangerous uh, ground of, of uh, opposition to a new lease, you know, where you intend to occupy for your own purposes. Uh, and it has been, as I mentioned in my uh, webinar, it has been known to be used to, as a deliberate ploy. Tenants think they've got a degree of security, probably agreeing short-term leases. And then the landlord just foists ground G on you and goes into occupation themselves. Um, the long and the short answer to that is there is a case that I didn't really um, sort of dwell on, as I recollect, in the webinar. It was in the notes, but I didn't really get time to, to, to talk about it. A case called Patel and Kellers from about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, which uh, all took place um, near the Middle Temple, Tudor Street, uh, you know, off Chancery Lane, um, but uh, where the, the tenants were running a news agents and you know, sweet shop kind of thing. Uh, and the landlord wanted to uh, oppose new lease on Ground G and occupy for their own purposes. They would own several neighbouring properties in the locality. And uh, they... Uh, Landlord seems to have genuinely intended, but agreed undertakings that it would only be used as a news agent for two years. You know, two years hence, he'd be ready to, to redevelop the whole row of premises and get rid of the tenants. The court accepted that, going back to your question, that um, you could have, um, you know, you're not stuck with that premises forevermore. If you've used Ground G one day in the future, you can sell it. But as he clearly intended, sort of two years hence, to actually sell the premises, they couldn't use Ground G. They failed in those circumstances. The other thing, I suppose, which is, uh, again, it's not something that was in, you know, as I mentioned in the webinar, time, time doesn't always permit, is I think it's Section 55 of the, the Act, which says that uh, you can sue for, for misrepresentation or concealment if the landlord basically lies and you either don't bother defending uh, the grounds of opposition or you um, you fail in your defence. But uh, the problem with that is that it's up to you to show that the landlord was lying and it's not too difficult to show that they just changed their mind. So, um, you know, subject to proof and the likes, if from day one, uh the landlord intends to sell albeit a few years down the line then you know he shouldn't be using ground you if he intends to um occupy and then years down the line decides to sell when they can i mean it's a question of it the intention in the landlord's mind at the time of the time yeah the time running the, the, the ground opposition isn't it and, and i mean um you can you, you it's easy to say oh well flogging the property within two years wouldn't be on but flogging the property within five years might be okay but i mean i wonder how many um uh landlords may have relied upon ground g which doesn't happen that often but i mean if they've gone into occupation themselves and then along came a pandemic 
kick the bottom out of their business yeah. and all they, all they could do is sell the property and move on. I mean, it's a totally unpredictable sort of occurrence and you, you can't really criticise their ground of opposition in that case, I think. I think, I mean, I mean the case I mentioned, the, the landlord did themselves <coughs> favours by only undertaking that it would be used as a news agent for two years, yeah. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is a strong suggestion he tends to do something differently. I think they more or less admitted it after two years. So it is the time of the, you know, you use the grounds of opposition, strictly speaking, I suppose, the court order when these yeah. things are, are basically decided. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question for you, Mark. Why would a tenant ever do anything else than complain to the local authority and leave it to them to investigate and take action to reg regulate the work? Okay, so... Um, this again, we're talking about landlords' works, obviously, uh, and um, it, it's an issue of whether there's being a statutory nuisance committed um, uh, or a, a nuisance committed. Let's put it that way. And um, you know, you have the option um, to sue for nuisance yourself, um, the, the private nuisance, so-called, in the law of tort, um, or you know, as a question reminds us you can um get the local authority involved and the environmental health officer will come along um and particularly in relation to noise they'll take all their um readings and uh, they will decide whether they think that there is an undue um annoyance and disturbance and they will make their recommendations as to hours of working and methods of working and and, and so forth um and i think the question is a very good one because you know um if you start going down the, the route of taking action yourself, then you're the one who's gathering evidence. You're the one who's employing acoustic consultants very expensively to go and lurk around the property with their recording equipment. Um, and, um, you know, you don't have any power to dictate to the landlord and say, this is what you must do in terms of working hours and equipment and so forth. Um, you know, you may be able to get those kind of terms involved in, in an injunction at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, if you leave it to the local authority to do it, they're doing it all at um, public expense. You know, it's, just, it's not all coming out of your pocket, so it's an awful lot easier. Um, and, um, uh, you know, they will have those those effective actions open to them. So if nothing else, it gives you a good basis for testing the strength of your claim in relation to in relation to nuisance. Um, and I think it, it's... Um, uh particularly in relation to noise i think i would always be looking at the um environmental health officer route if i were acting for a tenant or indeed a neighboring occupier complaining about noise nuisance from from building work um if you have um other aspects that you think are causing you a nuisance whether it's dust um whether it's uh, a degree of obstruction of the public highway or something of that sort um then i think i might be more inclined to um to look at private action uh, and, and of course um uh, uh, although the local authority can can tell the landlord the person carrying out work how to do the work and when to do the work um that is something which is enforceable by the local authority it's not something that you yourself can do anything about if you end up going down the private route and you get an injunction well then of course there you have the benefit of a court order which is in your favor if the landlord um breaches the terms of that injunction then you have some rather draconian sort of remedies you can use against them they can be fined they can be sent to prison even um so so that's kind of you know there's an advantage from that point of view and if you want a monetary compensation if you want to check for damages then you've got to go down the private route rather than relying upon the the uh, the local authority um but no i think i agree with the kind of suggestion of the question that um it, it is almost always cheaper and more convenient and more effective to get the local authority involved Many years ago, I used to do some housing law, um, and I haven't really sort of done well, little bits and bobs this last years. But that's always the first thing. If there's something, you know, this is obviously different. You know, we're talking about residential properties, but the first course of action was go and see the local authority, environmental health, and if they do it all for you, uh, that's the way of doing it. And if you want damages claims on top of that, you can bring damages claims. It's, I don't think it's no different. The other thing is in sort of even in freehold, which is not what we're here really to talk about. There's been a, quite a few recent cases on nuisance or annoyance covenants, uh, which have been actionable in damages or injunctions stopping potentially quite major building work and the likes. 
Mm. Annoyance is actually wider than nuisance. Sure. Um, yeah, if you've got a nuisance and an annoyance covenant, uh, you can might not be committing a nuisance in the, the sort of public nuisance, private nuisance sense of the word, but you can still be committing annoyance. Okay. Uh, next question is for you, Richard. Can the tenant solicitor sign a statutory declaration? Well, yeah, he can, but uh, there's another matter of whether he should. Um, I don't, I personally, I mean, it's a question I get asked over, over the years, and it obviously became very topical a couple of years back with the, the various lockdowns and not being able to see clients and the likes and witness these things. Um, I, I personally, I don't know what Mark thinks about it. I don't think it's a good good idea, but sometimes it's a necessity. I definitely wanted the express agency uh, for that to happen and uh, evidence of such from the tenants themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any technical difficulty with it. I, I don't think, um, I mean, if you are, we're talking about the tenants signing the statutory declaration rather than witnessing the statutory declaration yeah. so um you'll have obviously given the client all the necessary advice they should have had about the um the transaction you know if that advice was wrong then it doesn't matter whether you sign the declaration or not you're still going to get sued you know um <laughs> but but um uh i think it's, it's it's the agency point which is the one personally i don't fuss about very much um but but but, but some people fuss about it um quite a lot the idea that you know yes as a solicitor you can be appointed as an agent to sign the stat deck but have you actually been appointed as the agent to sign, to sign the stat deck um and i think it's a question of policy how far you go in checking that if you're the um you know the landlord solicitor you want to see that uh the tenant solicitor had the authority to sign the stat deck i mean if we're going to be silly about it you know if you're talking about a a, a tenant which is a limited company um then really what you want to see is a board minute yeah. um authorizing the solicitor to sign the start deck or or perhaps you know getting even sillier uh, a board minute authorizing a named company officer to authorize the solicitor to sign the start deck and then of course you want to see the letter of authority from that company officer to the solicitor to sign the start deck yeah, uh, and none of us it. none of us are getting paid enough to do that sort of, that <laughs> sort of exercise you know uh, and um I don't think any client would thank you for doing it. And, and no, I think, I think what, what, it's really serious, no, sensible about these things. Yeah, I think what happens in practice is people bung off an email and say, can you confirm you're authorised? And an email comes back saying yes, and that's probably good enough most of the time, I think, if you're mm. being sensible about it. I mean, it's so, also, so it's, I mean not so much in the start deck uh, signature, but uh, I remember, again, so it was mentioned by Mike in the introductions, you know, done over the years quite a lot for, for central government. And, you know, who on earth gives authority in some central government body, you know, sort of in getting to see evidence and yes, they can sign this and yes, they can sign that. You know, it's, I think sometimes you've just got to be sensible. These things rarely cause problems. I mean, the, 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 there's more of a worry, I think, with the unrepresented tenant, um, mm. you know, who um, take the stat deck and just sign it and send it back without getting it witnessed by a solicitor and then you can't persuade them to spend a fiver and you know take it to a solicitor and get it to uh, get it properly witnessed you know it, I, I think those things are more difficult i've never been quite sure what the stat decks were designed to achieve anyway you know when they came in with the, the reforms of the 54 act in 2005 mm. just never not never quite sure you know what you're, you're not really giving huge amounts of legal advice on a stat deck you shouldn't be you shouldn't be no absolutely i mean if you, uh, you know, somebody walks in off the street and says can i please do this stat deck and if you start advising them as the merits of the thing well they become their client they well done you. you've taken <laughs> you've taken on as a client with no client engagement procedures uh, yeah it's just it makes no sense hmm. yeah. anyway. okay um next questions come up in the chat box so uh, if a tenant remains in occupation after the expiry of the term holding over how could the landlord regain possession to, for example, relet the premises to someone else? Well, I presume this is me. Uh, is this a was this a fifty four act or tenancy? If it was a fifty four act protected tenancy, they're entitled to hold over under under a continuation tenancy. 
and the landlord, if he wanted to relate to somebody else, would have to, to show grounds. Um, uh, so a Section 25 notice and show grounds for uh, opposition if, if, the, if the tenant was hell-bent on staying put. Uh, but you'd have to show grounds. I presume that's what it's getting at. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it, it, it does really depend on what's meant by holding over, doesn't it? Mm. Um, I mean, if somebody's, if, 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 if somebody's just sitting there and they have no arrangement of any sort with the landlord, um, well, they're a trespasser. <coughs> You know, well, they're a trespasser if it was, as you say, if it was a 54 Act tenancy, of course, they're not. They're entitled to be there. That's fine. If they, if it was a contracted out tenancy, they're just a trespasser. Simple yeah. as that. Well, I mean, the worst thing that can happen, and it happens a huge amount, it's probably happening sometime today, uh, that, uh, you know, somewhere today, that uh, it's a 54 Act excluded lease and the fixed term tenancy comes to an end and the tenant then just stays put and starts tendering and the landlord accepts rental. Uh, because you might just find in those circumstances, well, you will find eventually in those circumstances, they've suddenly got 54 Act protected lease and you know, 54 Act periodic tenancy based on how they, you know, pay the rental. Uh, and also, if there were guarantors, you would uh, lose your guarantors. You've never agreed the new lease. And that's the very worst case scenario. Mm. And they, you, know, you treat them as a trespasser if you want to get in possession. And uh, you know, basically get them out like that. As, as was mentioned, if it was 54 out protected, uh, then it uh, would need to be a Section 25 notice and grounds of opposition if the tenant stays put. Which can take you a long, long time. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, if you're treating them as a trespasser, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it is a non-54 Act lease that's expired, then, then of course, that also gives you the claim for double rent, which, which you'll never get in practice. But if we're, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit of persuasion. You know? Well, I have to make the, the fact that if they give notice and then decide to stay, mm -hmm. you can claim double rent. I've seen the threat of that sort of um, cause them to leave before now. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean tenants don't know that, that the landlord will never get it. So you know, <laughs> you can always claim triple rent. You're not entitled to it. <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, next question is for you, Mark. Um, if the EHO decides there is no statutory nuisance, is there any chance of the tenant succeeding in a claim for private nuisance? Okay, so that's going to building on the last one really um and um i think the answer is in practice very little i mean we're, we're talking noise nuisance here i think principally but i mean if, if um uh you know uh, they're different legal tests whether there's a statutory nuisance or whether there's a private nuisance all the evidence is the same you know and if um you know, the environmental health officer who deals with this stuff all the time says it amounts to a statutory nuisance 98 percent probable it's it's going to be a private nuisance and, and and the other way around if the eho decides it isn't a statutory nuisance it probably isn't a private nuisance as well in practice um if, if not necessarily in theory so it's, it's a quite quite a short answer i think to that one okay any input richard not particularly it's um i think uh mark said it all Okay. Well, this one's for you. Uh, can I claim vehicle access across a village green? Oh, I've got a non lease old one. Village green is my favourite. Um, uh, there used to be a debate about this until comparatively recently, because um, um, there's a couple of Victorian pieces of legislation, the Commons Act and the Enclosure Act, which is still applicable, which actually bring in public nuisances if you interfere with the locals' use. Uh, of a village green, it, it constitutes a criminal offence. It's a public nuisance. Uh, so, for instance, you can't uh, build on the on the village green. It's sort of subject to a lot of provisos. Uh, it became a wonderful way of stopping developments dead in their tracks, um, claiming village greens. Uh, and there used to be an argument, certainly, that you can't drive vehicles across the village green. There was a case uh, I did mention actually in the the, the webinar. Um, TW Logistics in Essex County Council is a Supreme Court case. Amazing how many Supreme Court cases you get on Village Greens. Um, uh, from the beginning of last year, or towards the beginning of last year, uh, which was all about uh, the locals claiming a Village Green in a, in a, in a 
docks, misty docks on the River Stour in Essex, and uh, they, they were claiming it was a village green based on their pastimes uh, of um, chatting. That was one of them, chatting uh, as a lawful pastime, and uh, also uh, feeding the swans was one, and um, and uh, catching crabs. As, crustacean sense of the word i suspect uh they um they uh tw logistics began this private port and they were arguing if this becomes a village green it was just a concrete quayside uh but uh, if it becomes a village green we won't be able to perform our functions um you know because we need to drive vehicles up to the quayside to load and unload the ships and the Supreme Court decided you can drive across the village green as long as you don't unduly disturb the locals. They can both live together. The case actually arose because the health and safety executive had told them to cordon off this land because there was going to be an accident. But the court uh, said that that's an irrelevance. Health and safety laws are irrelevant. So yes, as long as you've got some actual right, you know, it's your land or presumably prescriptive rights or whatever, or express easement. It's finally been decided you can drive across a village green. As long as you don't unduly disturb too many of the locals. <coughs> Nothing to add from me on that one. Um, well, they, yeah. It's a quite an interesting case, actually. The, uh, the, the main instigator of the claim was a Mr. Tucker, who spent 10 years of his life uh, arguing we can chat on the quayside. Uh, <laughs> make you think. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, the next one's for you, Mark. Um, are Jervis versus Harris notices really effective in practice? Okay, um, so Jarvis and Harris notices, um, I'm sure you all know, but just very briefly, the kind of um, the procedure whereby under a lease, a landlord, um, if there's work which a tenant should carry out, like typically repair work, um, they can serve a notice on the tenant requiring them to do it. If the tenant doesn't do it within a specified time, then the landlord can go into the property itself, do the work and um, send the tenant the bill at the end of the day. And um, uh, if, if that all sounds a bit too good to be true, it, it possibly is slightly too good to be true um, in that um, one of the difficulties is um, you won't necessarily get in to do the work because um, the tenant may say, well, that's going to breach my quiet enjoyment covenant and uh, they may obtain an injunction to stop the landlord getting in. That has happened. It's not always going to happen, but it has happened. Um, next problem is that unless you have identified the work um, which is at issue in the the notice or probably in a schedule attached to the notice then you don't have that right to do the work and you don't have the right to recover the cost from the tenant so what happens when as we all know happens once you start doing work on a property as soon as you start getting into the roof void and getting plaster off and so forth you immediately find more stuff that needs doing you know that that's just a, a problem without any obvious solution um plus of course if the landlord is going to spend money doing the work but it's taking a gamble on its ability to recover that cost back from the tenant. So all of those are kind of issues with Jarvis and Harris procedures. Um, I am a bit of a kind of um, advocate for the Jarvis and Harris procedure because in my experience, I mean, I'm, any of those three problems, they're only problems if you get to the stage of actually going into the property to do the work yourself. Um, and in my experience, that rarely happens. What usually happens is that service of the notice prompts a negotiation and something gets done it may not be everything you want gets done but something gets done and that takes you that little bit further along the way um and uh just just two little stories about that very briefly one which is not in my personal experience but i was doing a tray session on um repair matters and talking about jarvis and harris notices um and um among the delegates was a surveyor from leeds and um <clears throat> and he said oh yeah we served a Jarvis and harris notice um it was a big industrial property in leeds and we were asking them to put a new roof on the on the place and uh he said, we, we were really just trying to negotiate the break option out of the lease he said bugger me they did it put a new roof on cost them a million quid um so you know people do re respond positively to these things um and from my own personal experience um we served a Jarvis and Harris notice asking for about half a million quid's worth to be done. The tenant was a um, FTSE 100 company, major corporate occupier. Um, the whole thing got very heated, as these things sometimes inexplicably do. And um, 
uh, lots and lots of heated correspondence and lengthy meetings and so forth uh, and telephone calls to the senior partner of my firm and that sort of thing. But um, shortly before the deadline expired and we were due to go in and do the work, they negotiated a program of work. They didn't do everything we wanted, but you know, as against the half a million we'd asked them to spend, they spent about 300,000. And um, it kind of felt like we'd been in a fight, but the reality is when you broke it down, all that happened is we'd served a notice and had some correspondence and they spent a six figure sum on the building. So, so I, I, I think the, that they can be very effective is the, is the answer to the question. I've also come across them used as a sort of last resort when the tenants up and left and done a runner, never to be seen again. And mm -hmm. you know, there's enough of them out there in the high street uh, as a way of just making sure that you can protect your, your your property basically against vandals getting in, and you know you can shore it up and make sure that uh, you're not expecting to to get any money back from anybody, but you're just protecting your property. That's a good point. And, and, and one other thing to mention is that. Um, uh, if you suspect that if you bring a, a damages claim, a dilapidations claim at the end of the term, that damages are going to be significantly reduced by the effect of Section 18 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927, that doesn't apply to Jarvis and Harris claims. So it, it, it's a way of getting around that problem as well. I think that the problem I've always thought um, is that you bring yourself within the Defective Premises Act and you're opening yourself up to claims. Uh, by third parties, you know, you're reserving the right to enter, carry out works in charge, and anybody who suffers as a consequence of disrepair can do you, which is why landlords should and probably have got insurance uh, against that sort of within your public liability insurance. I think that's one of the, the drawbacks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, we're back to Village Greens again, Richard. Oh, okay. Um, what is the best way of preventing a village green arising? Well, that's going to take us up to two o'clock. <laughs> uh, 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 to, to claim a village green is slightly different in England and Wales, actually, but the gist of it, I mean, it's in the notes anyway. But uh, if you've got to show uh, user as of right for the prescription period, 20 years, you know, without forced secrecy or permission, and it's got to be a significant number of the inhabitants of the locality or neighborhood within the locality. One obvious way of stopping the village green uh, claim is uh, fencing off the land if you can. Lots of the claims involve land that are crisscrossed with footpaths which can't be fenced off. Uh, and uh, you have to sort of maintain the fences commensurate with your resources. Sometimes I've seen with government bodies and the likes that uh, it becomes political you know, to, to remove the fences and let the locals use the land. Uh, so you put signage up, you're given permission to be there and again commensurate with your resources. Uh, you check the signages there. Um, there are alternatives, I mean, because the number of village green claims that was going in in about 10, 12, 10 years or more ago, uh was so enormous that's when the government uh slightly different again in england and wales but the the growth in infrastructure act came into force in in 2013. uh you can make uh, you can sort of lay a statement and plan with the local authority basically that the land isn't being used as a right you have to pay a well it depends on which local authority you're in, but a few hundred pounds fee to do so one problem with that is that if the locals have already got their 20 years user as of right, um, you'll put them on notice, it'll feature on local land charges, and you'll put, they'll put you on notice and they'll make a claim. Uh, the alternative, again, different, that's the same in England and Wales, more or less. Uh, a bit different in England and Wales, but uh, in England, once you've, um, uh, once the land features within a development plan, or if you've got planning permission, uh, oh, sorry, if you've uh, not got planned permission, but if you made a planning application that's been published, it's too late for a village green claim. In Wales, there's got to be actual planning permission. Unfortunately, as soon as you make the planning application, the locals will know about it and claim village green. So there are ways of doing it. Um, well, that's it. And police your land. I mean, I've seen village greens be tiny parcels of land in huge pieces of land. Okay, I don't know if you. Nope. Nothing for me. Okay. Um, well, the next one's for you, Mark. Right. As the <clears throat> Coronavirus Act 2020 restrictions have gone, could a landlord now oppose renewal of a lease relying on late payment of rent falling due during the pandemic? 
So uh, that I think is a point that I didn't cover in the in the uh, presentation on this, which is um, uh, when the right to forfeit for non-payment of rent was suspended uh, from the end of March 2020 under the Coronavirus Act 2020. Um, one possibility that raised was that although a landlord might not be able to forfeit a lease for non-payment of rent, when they got to the the end of the term and it was a lease within the 1954 Act, um, the landlord might be able to um, oppose renewal of the lease on ground B, which is um, persistent delay in payment of rent. So that was blocked off by the government. There's a specific provision in the Coronavirus Act saying, um, no, you can't rely upon that in relation to rent falling due during that period when the right to forfeit was, was suspended. Now, unless you're talking about protected rent debt, which goes down the compulsory arbitration scheme route under the, corona, uh, the, the Commercial Rent Coronavirus Act of 2022, um, which is not that many arrears. So for most landlords and most arrears of rent, the right to forfeit for non-payment of rent is back um, and, uh, and you can do that. Does that also mean that that protection in relation to ground B has gone? Answer, no, there is, that is specifically preserved by provision in the, the 2022 Act. Um, because, you know, obviously the, the, the pandemic period was a period when, um, you know, all, all, all these exceptional kind of circumstances applied and you can't sort of, um, you know, one year or two years after that, uh, pretend that that wasn't the case and go back and complain about the tenant having, having uh, persistently um, paid their rent late or not paid their rent during that period. Um, so the short answer is no, a landlord can't oppose renewal on that basis in relation to rent falling due during the, the pandemic period. Just a specific provision in the Act, nothing really more to say about that, I don't think. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know if you're going to touch upon it, uh, but I, I think um, the 2022 uh, Commercial Grant Coronavirus Act is terribly ill thought out. I think it was rushed through too much because it's got to be, like you say, protected rent debt before you can't use ground B um, uh, for the protected period. You know, it depends on when there was some sort of mandated whole or partial closure, as you appreciate. But it only applies to business tenancies and uh, within the 54 Act, including excluded leases. I think the biggest problem they've not really thought about amongst many is uh, if there's a sublease. Which is peculiar because they anticipated exactly that in the Coronavirus Act 2020. Yeah. Um, it... Why they haven't matched the two, who knows? Um, no, I, I, I think there's, there's lots of reasons to criticise the 2022 Act, and as you say, I think rather rushed. Yeah. Because if it's a sublease, it's you, it's almost certainly the, the subtenant who's occupation under the fifty four right? Yeah, yeah. Amongst other things. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's keeping me going at the moment. It might be <laughs> flawed, but it's keeping me going. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, Richard, this one's for you. How can I stop neighbours claiming a right to light? Oh, this again. I'll try and be brief on it. Um, Right to the light is something I was touching upon when I did the, uh, I don't know if anybody was listening in or looking in at the um, the, the residential uh, course a couple of weeks back, um, because they can be in a very effective way of stopping developments. You're entitled to a reasonable amount of light and uh, the vast majority of you know, the easements and the vast majority of rights to light are not expressly created like, through prescription. And, uh, you know, the law is the prescription is a, is a law unto itself that no one understands fully. But it's basically 20 years user as of a right gives you an absolute right to light unless it's enjoined by written agreement. So one thing developers do at the very beginning is give written agreement, you know, to, to sort of make sure that you don't accumulate rights to light over the next 20 years. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, there's another possibility. Uh, which is amazingly rarely used, and that's the Rights of Light Act of 1959. You can make a fictitious... Well, you can either... You know, to, to, to claim rights to light, you've uh, got to have 20 years, but you, if you interrupt the use for a year, then they lose the sort of time period, if you like. So you have to act within 19 years and a day as a property owner who's been potentially subject to rights to light. You could do one thing, you could put a big fence up in front of their windows. That's uh, one possibility before 19 years of the day has passed. But uh, the alternative is the Rights of Light Act. You register a sort of fictitious right of light 
uh, you have to again do it within 19 years and a day and it gets protected on local land charges and once in a blue moon you see these things I'm amazed they're not used more often to, to stop rights of light they can stop developments left right and center and that's more or less it local land charge or initially make sure it's with written agreement I agree. You're very underused. The rights of light act. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Mark, this one's for you. Uh, how does a tenant or landlord appropriate a payment to any particular rent instalments? Okay, so this is relevant to the operation of the the moratorium period under the the, the Commercial Rent Coronavirus Act 2022. Um, as a sort of broader question, and it's relevant to all sorts of things like in the law of forfeiture and so forth, but um, you know, where you have an ongoing account between two parties, like a landlord and tenant for our purpose, um, so there's various payments coming in. Um, the question can arise, you know, if there's a number of payments which are due um, and a particular payment comes in, then which one should it be regarded as referring to? Um, and that may have various consequences, including for the coronavirus moratorium. Um, and um, uh, this goes to a grand phrase, you know, the principles of appropriation, but it, it's, it's first dibs, basically. You know, if the tenant says, this is the rent for the June quarter, well, it's the rent for the June quarter. And there's nothing the landlord can do about it. It's whoever gets in first. If the tenant doesn't say anything about it well then the landlord can say you know this is actually for the march quarter you know um it, it, it's 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 completely up to them but um as to how you appropriate a particular payment of rent um you know there's no formality about it is if there's a particular factual indication um i mean it is pretty unusual these days for a tenant to write you a letter and send you a check saying here's a check for the june quarter's rent um uh, what they're more likely to do is to pay by electronic transfer and um there, I mean, you might find when you look at the bank statement and you see what reference they've put on that payment, they may have taken the reference from the June quarter's rent invoice, in which case you can say they've appropriated it to the June quarter's rent invoice. Or um, other circumstances might also give rise to a kind of inference. I mean, if the rent is £5,000 a quarter and there is outstanding £3,533.11p for service charge and a payment comes in for £3,533.11p but it's a fairly obvious inference that it's for the outstanding service charge and not for any payment of rent. Um, so it's purely a factual question I think as to uh, whether there's been any indication that the payment is for any particular instalment or any particular item. So, Richard, any input on that? Uh, no, it's, it's also the fact isn't it that um... It's apportioned on a daily basis as well, isn't it? Uh, what uh, What is, sorry? The, the... The, the rent, you know, so if you straddle uh, a time period when you were subject to mandated you know, the, uh, shutdown or whatever, um, yeah. and not, then it's on a daily basis. That's right, isn't it? That's, that's right, in, in terms of how that, um, how, how the um, continuing moratorium period works. Yeah, that's right. uh, in, yeah. In, in, yeah. in terms of protected rent debt, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Richard, for you, how can I find out whether neighbouring premises has a right to light? Uh, well, you can have a look at how long their windows have been there. It's got to be through a defined aperture, which uh, you and I probably know is a window, uh, for 20 years. What tends to happen in the big developments, obviously not in the more mundane ones, is you send... Uh, surveyors around and there are people who specialize in nothing but rights to light you see if there are any windows in neighboring premises you know which have obviously been there for 20 years and that uh, you might uh, you know be unduly blocking their right to light and then you offer them a sum of money you know to reflect that fact and you build it into the uh, the costs of you know how much you're paying for the development and how much you're paying for the site if you're buying the site that you intend to develop at a later stage I so say it tends to be quite specialist, so specialist surveyor stuff as to how much light you're entitled to. So in the bigger developments, I just send some surveyors around and check. Obviously, it's not really feasible in some of the tinier ones. I've seen things like extensions, residential extensions, sort of stopping people developing, you know, neighbouring premises. It can be as mundane as that. Okay. okay. 
Mark, any inputs? Um, just to observe, you know, if you do have a right of light surveyor, come and take measurements. Uh, it's it's fascinating the kind of measurements they take of, you know, the amount of light is enjoyed at tabletop level in the room or how the, the way they go about calculating it is um, absolutely uh, astounding and impressive. But um, anyway, there it is. Uh, it's always what's left is what's left enough to reasonably enjoy the land. It's not what's been taken away. Yeah. But uh, it's always a... I mean, you know, you can never cease to be amazed at some of these things, how accurate they seem to be. It's just like a sort of a value is and how accurate they are in lease renewals at what the new rental should be mm -hmm. to the nearest 10 pence and things. And yeah. I, always, I wish somebody could explain it to me. <laughs> OK, well, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Thank you for attending Law 2022 online. Commercial property spring shape the debate. Don't forget to join the Solicitors Group Law 2022 online community on LinkedIn to continue the debate after the live session and to be included in exclusive offers for future events. As I mentioned at the beginning, a recording of today's live Q&A will be available on the website within the next few days. If you have purchased the online course, there is still time to watch the pre-recorded content your expiry date will be displayed next to the webinar. If you have not, then you can still buy the complete event, including a recording of this live session. To book, just go to www.thesolicitorsgroup.co.uk, where you will also find the online exhibition. The exhibition is open for anyone to visit, and if you have looked, booked the entire event, you can claim your free one-hour CPD webinar from the webinar learning catalogue worth £35 plus VAT. Finally, the feedback form for this course is found in the related links section, and by completing and submitting this, you will receive your CPD certificate via email. Thank you again, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.